All right, how can you hack into a website? What is the OWASP top 10 list and what exactly does it teach us to do? Um, for example, these different vulnerabilities that exist and can you actually use these vulnerabilities that are on the OWASP top 10 list to hack into websites? That's literally the content of the video that we're going to be talking about today. And it's actually a really fun one because the internet is full of websites and if you have beef with somebody, you can go ahead and hack them. So uh, that is the entire purpose of the video today your boy Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers and if you want to find more videos like this feel free to rummage around the website or the the channel that we got over here and if you want to get more videos like this in the future make sure you like subscribe and turn on that notification bell so that you get notified the next time that a video comes out now without further ado let's jump into the hacking of the websites room here let's get some fun going all right in this video we're gonna go through the top 10 uh, specific security vulnerabilities for web applications. That's what Open uh, OWASP stands for. It's the Open Web Application Security Program, I think, is what the full acronym stands for. And uh, we're going to be going through each one of these individually, and then we're going to uh, get some details on it and maybe even some exercises to show us, uh, you know, how all these things actually apply and what you can do to exploit these specific security vulnerabilities. So uh, let's jump into it. The first one is broken access control. And what that basically means is that the, web, the pages or parts of your web application that should be accessed only by admins, for example, shouldn't be accessed by any other users. They shouldn't be accessed by the public. Uh, these specific pages, uh, if they have access to the public or other users that means that the access control for that page is broken and this is the top vulnerability in the last OWASP top 10 list that was dropped out uh, it was in 2021 this was the top vulnerability meaning most applications most websites and all these different things had web pages that were available to non-privileged users that should not have been uh, available so Simply put, broken access control allows attackers to bypass authorization, allowing them to view sensitive data or perform tasks that they're not supposed to because those pages were not blocked off or they were not secure. So that is the main vulnerability that has uh, happened. And there's an example here uh, that was in 2019. There was a vulnerability that was found. And this is it. Uh, if you wanted to go check it out, you can Google this, stealing your private YouTube videos one frame at a time. You can go and check this out and literally you could just search for that stealing your private videos one frame at a time uh, but the attacker could get a single frame from a youtube video marked as private and then the uh, vulnerability that he could ask for several frames and somewhat reconstruct the video and since the expectation from a user when making videos private would be that nobody has access to it this was indeed accepted as a broken access control vulnerability and this is on youtube of all uh, places so you got to understand that Google backs YouTube. It's a gigantic business and it's relatively recent. It was just five years ago. 2019 was five years ago. Holy cow. Um, but it was just five years ago that this thing happened. So it's uh, it could happen to anybody, even the biggest uh, name in the game. And if that's the case, that means that you're also vulnerable to it, too. So let's actually look at an EDOR challenge, um, which is the insecure object reference uh, challenge. So let's go check that out and see what we can exploit here. An insecure direct object reference is essentially something that is available to, on a site that you can access. So for example, in this case, it's the ID here that we see. And you shouldn't be able to, number one, you shouldn't be able to see it. So this link is a bad link. But then the second part that's like really crazy is that you shouldn't be able to edit this. So in this example, the person that you know landed on their account is Jay Clark and their ID is 111111. And then they changed their ID to 22, 22, 22, and they got access to Nick Perry's uh, account information while they're still logged in as Jay Clark over here. So this is called an EDOR vulnerability, meaning that the, the insecure direct object reference is something that is inside of the link that you shouldn't be able to get access to. And then when uh, you can change anything about that link and sometimes even things within the web page, you can change certain things just about the link or the web page and it gives you access to certain pages and certain information and even certain functions. 
and those things should not be available to you. They should not be possible. So that is one of the most basic and honestly very common uh, forms of uh, uh, broken access control that can happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually go to the website that I had to launch here. There was a machine, a virtual machine that I was supposed to launch. We're going to actually go to that virtual machine through the attack box that we have here. And then from there, we're going to go through uh, the just some of the web pages that are there and try to find this flag that's available at the bottom right here. So it's going to be in the user's notes. So I am going to uh, wait for this thing to load real quick and then we're actually going to run that. All right, here we go. We are logged in. I logged in with the newt and test1234 username password. This is the link that I'm on. Uh, when you launch a virtual machine through Try Hack Me, they give you an IP address and then you can either connect to it via VPN from your own machine or from the attack box that they have. So I just use the attack box. And so when you log in and when you land on the home page, this is what it looks like. You have uh, notes, uh, you know, things to buy from the store, yada, yada, yada. And then we have the URL, which is the important part right here. So as we noticed uh, in the previous example or in, in the documentation of this, the URL can be changed, right? So if I go from one to two to three to four, whatever it is, I should be able to find other users uh, and notes information. And so uh, that's literally what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, uh, you know, go through cycle through all the different numbers, the ID numbers and then see which user will actually have a flag note for me to check. So let's run it and see what we can find here. Okay, here we go. So it was actually on ID zero. So I went from one and uh, I went all the way up when I got to, <clears throat> when I got to five, it gave me a hint and it said, uh, you know, maybe they start less than one or whatever the hint was. And then it said, try going less than one. And so I went to zero and here is our flag. But basically the whole idea is we just cycle through all of the IDs and then we found uh, the information that we needed and that's pretty much it. So that's what broken access control means. You get to access pages that you're not supposed to access. And that's that all, literally all that means. So uh, let's talk about cryptographic failures. Cryptography is essentially encrypting data. Uh, we did a whole video on this and you can go check that out. Um, when you encrypt data, that means you are taking it from clear text, which is like this, and you're just turning it into a bunch of uh, jargon, essentially just a bunch of numbers and letters and symbols and things like that. And so you've now encrypted the data and you can either encrypt data in transit, which means while it's being transferred from one place to another, or you can encrypt data at rest, meaning where it's sitting in a place and then nobody's, you know, it's not moving anywhere, but it can be accessed. You can go get that data that it's sitting in rest somewhere, resting somewhere. Uh, either of those things are very, very important. So you have to encrypt your data and the, the more complex algorithm that you use to encrypt your data, the better off you'll be. Now, what happens is that sometimes the encryption is weak and people can go and decrypt it easily or sometimes it's not even encrypted to begin with, right? So if it's weakly encrypted or it's not encrypted at all, while it's in transit, somebody which is considered an eavesdropper and then the attack name right there is called the man in the middle attack, meaning that somebody stands in the middle of the, the, lo the source point and then the end point. And then that person is now able to get the data while it's being transferred in transit. And that is a big uh, attack. It's something that actually happens all the time. And uh, it's one of the, again, one of the more common uh, web application vulnerabilities. That's why it's number two in the top 10. So non-encryption of data is a big deal. Uh, if you use ports that are not secure or encrypted, you are leaving yourself vulnerable. If you use weak encryption, you're leaving yourself vulnerable. Uh, encryption... Uh, algorithms have evolved throughout time and the very first one was MD5 and then as time went by it became more and more secure and so if you use a weak one which is the MD5 or the MD1 let's say if you use something like that to encrypt your data you're just asking for people to decrypt your stuff and and break into your uh, not just your your data sets wherever they're sitting but log in as your username and do all that jazz that they can finally do so 
it is very important to make sure that your stuff is encrypted and uh, cryptography, 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 cryptography is the concept of encryption of data. So if there's a cryptographic failure, that means it was either not encrypted in the first place or there was a really weak encryption that was used to go ahead and encrypt that data. So let's talk about or let's actually go ahead and use some supporting material to actually look at some cases, some real life cases of how cryptography can end up hurting somebody. All right, we have two supporting material sections for our cryptography uh, exercise. And so the first one just teaches us a little bit about the structured query, query language, uh, which is called SQL. And SQL is essentially a database language. So it's really easy to store a bunch of data, uh, you know, large, large databases inside of a language like this. And it could be MySQL, MariaDB. A lot of these things use the SQL uh, syntax or type of language. And so once you understand the general concept of how SQL works, you can essentially parse through large data sets and find the type of data that you need. And this is done very frequently for a lot of just normal business activity. But if it's not properly secured, then as a hacker, as an attacker, somebody can go and you know, parse through that data and find really, really sensitive information. So uh, an example of this would be what we're going to be doing just or what we're looking at right here. So there's something called SQLite 3, which is a, basically a client that makes it very easy for you to use the command line to parse through databases. And in this particular case, uh, you know, we've uh, downloaded a database. So we have some kind of database file that we were able to download and it usually ends with .db. And so if uh, ls, I mean, I'm not going to go through basic Linux commands here, but uh, running an ls command, they found that there was a database file and so then used file uh, example db just to see what kind of file it is. So when you use that file, it shows you what kind of file you're dealing with and it says SQLite 3.0 such and such. And so since it's an SQLite database, you can just use SQLite as the command, including the database name to be able to get some information. And so when you do SQLite 3 and then you use the database name, it actually changes your command line from your user to the SQLite command. And then from there, you can start doing some really interesting things. So if you just do dot tables, it'll show you where all the tables uh, exi exist inside of that database. So in our example database, there is a table called customers. And then from there, you can do a pragma table info customers, and it gives you the breakdown of the columns that are inside of this table. And in this case, we see that table zero, which is the very first uh, column is the customer ID. Then you have the customer name, the credit card information of the customer and the password hash of the customer. So when we're looking at this, you know, column zero is the ID. So 0123, et cetera. Column, uh, the, their name is Joy Paulson. And then Joy Paulson's credit card information is this. And then their password hash is this. So having all of this information, you can now do some, you know, nifty little hacks here uh, against any of these users here. And all it took is for us to first run the pragma table info command on the customers. We got the different information of the table columns. And then we run the select everything. So asterisk stands for everything. Um, it's a wild card character. So you want to do select everything from customers, right? A very, very basic SQL command. And so you want to do everything from that table and it gives you all the information that is inside of the customer's table. And just like that, you have all that information. Um, and now you can do, again, some really interesting little hacks. So uh, for this case, we're going to be uh, using uh, some kind of a hash cracker to be able to crash Joy, uh, or ha uh, crack Joy Paulson's hash and then probably log in as Joy Paulson and get some other sensitive data. So uh, that was the first set of supporting material. And we're going to get the second set of supporting material, which is basically going to show us how to crack that hash. And the tool that we're using in this case to crack the hash is a website called CrackStation, which is absolutely amazing. It's super, super easy to use. And it's kind of scary how easy it is to use. You don't need to know any command line or anything like that. You just need somebody's hash. And so if you go to CrackStation at the bottom right here or in the middle of the page, it shows you all of the different encryption uh, algorithms that it supports that it can decrypt for you. 
And some of these things right here are very, very secure. So a SHA-512 encryption algorithm is a very, very strong algorithm. But what's important to understand here is if you have a weak password, that password is most likely stored inside something called a rainbow table. And a rainbow table is essentially a list very similar to uh, uh, you know, the, the SQL database type of a list where you have on, the, on one column, you have the password hash. On the other column, you have the uh, clear text word associated with that hash. What we need to understand is that you can't decrypt a hash by itself. So unless you have uh, a database of stored passwords, for example, the RockU password list, which is 15 million passwords stored inside of this text file that's available for free that anybody can get. And unless you have something like that, you can't just go and decrypt a hash. And the way that CrackStation works is that they already have a large database of password hashes that have been stored and they also have the clear text version of that password hash so for example uh, we're going to do a md5 hash generator and i'm just going to show you what this looks like if you wanted to just create a weak password versus a strong password so if i use the word password as my password okay and i generate that then it gives me my md5 as well as my sha1 hash for this so if i go and copy this and I put this inside of CrackStation, and then I crack this, it's going to give me the word because it, for the word password, the hash value is always going to be the same. So whatever the hash value is for a certain phrase, it's never going to change no matter where you go. So that hash value is already stored inside of CrackStation. So no big deal, right? And if I change this by literally one letter, so even if I if I don't even change it by a letter, if I just change the first letter into a capital P and I do generate hash, so pay attention to this hash right here, we do generate hash and then the hash value completely changes. It's no longer the same hash and all we did was we just changed the first letter of this thing and so if I copy this again and if I go here and I paste it in here and run the crack hash, it's going to show me the, the clear text password because password with a capital P is still a very weak password and it goes for any variation of this if you use dollar signs instead of S's if you use a zero instead of an O all of those things are all stored inside of the rainbow table of a website like CrackStation now if I use this as an example so let's do this is a strong password one two three four five six seven eight nine and then we'll do this so let's say this is my password right crazy long password and it should not be stored anywhere <laughs> inside of CrackStation. So if I go ahead and take the hash value for this, so let me copy this real quick. So if I take the hash value for this and then come to CrackStation, I should get an error message. So hopefully nobody has ever used that password. Yeah, so now you get an error message because within their database, within their rainbow table, there is no previous password that's been stored that is this long ass you know, it, every first letter has been capitalized. There's a bunch of numbers in it. There's some special characters in it. So this super long password, no longer, it doesn't exist in any password dictionary online. So therefore, CrackStation can't find it for us. And this is how important uh, a website like CrackStation is and knowing how to use it. So they're not going to decrypt the hash value for you. What they're doing is they're comparing against the data set that they already have to see whether or not that password already exists in their data set. And then if it does, they show you the result of it. So that's how CrackStation works. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to decrypt uh, this specific password hash that they gave us the same way that we just did right here. And then we're gonna look at it. And so that it's literally actually the password that we used before. So it's the word password has been uh, saved over there as a password here. So you can, this is how you use CrackStation. Now there's a bunch of different command line tools that you can also use to decrypt hashes or decode hashes, I guess we can say. And uh, something like John the Ripper or Hashcat or uh, Kane Enable. There's a lot of different tools, Hydra, all these things. There's a lot of different stuff that you can use to decode or decrypt a hash value. So that's the supporting, uh, the, the supporting material too for cryptographic failure. So now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go through a challenge and we're going to find some of the hash values that we can use um, and decrypt in this particular case when it's attached to this specific website right here. So let's go check that out and have some fun with that.
All right, I am now on this link right here, the uh, 1010. I just opened it up in a new uh, window just to make it a little bit easier for us to analyze. And uh, it says right here in the question one, it says that the developer uh, has left themselves a note indicating that there's sensitive data somewhere. So in order to be able to look at the developer's notes, we literally are going to just look at the source code of the page. And through all the browsers, you can do this. If you just right click on the page, as part of the right click uh, menu, the little thing that pops up, it shows you an option called inspect or uh, view source, uh, something similar to those lines. It just depends on which browser that you're using that the the text uh, or the command for that is going to change. But essentially, it's along those lines where you can either inspect the source code of the page or you can view the source, uh, something along those lines. And then once you do, you'll be able to see what is the actual source code of the page and then within the source code of the page you can see what the developer has left for themselves as any kind of a note so we're going to do that here and then from there we're going to try to find the developer's notes all right and this is what it looks like so i'm on mozilla and when i did the right click it gave me an option called inspect and that's what it does it shows you basically literally the source code of the page and now we want to scan this source code that's at the bottom right here to try to find the information that the developer has left for themselves. So let's see what we can find inside of this source code here. All right, right off the bat inside the header information or inside the head part of the code, there is just something that seems a little bit uh, interesting is the assets folder. So href equals assets style CSS home style CSS. So assets just from here it just stands out um, let's see what else we can find here real quick all right so it wasn't on the home page but when i go to login i just literally click the login button at the top right here uh, there is a note right here by the developer and uh, it's been commented out so you don't actually see it on the web page itself but it says must remember to do something better with the database than store it in assets so the database is stored in assets.php or assets forward slash. So uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to go inside of the assets uh, directory inside of this web page and see what we can find in there. And here we go. So we are now in the assets directory and there's a little DB file. There's a database file here that I am going to click on and see what I can find in there. All right, when we click on that link, it downloads the file for us, the webapp.db file. So what we're gonna do in this case, we're gonna literally do the same thing that they showed us in the exercise. First, we're gonna do file.webapp.db to see what kind of file that we're dealing with. And it says that it's an SQLite3 something something uh, database file. So then I'm gonna do SQLite3 and then I'm gonna do webapp.db and it's going to open, oops, I did SQ Life. Uh, there is no such thing as SQ Life. So SQ Light 3 uh, web app .db. And then it's going to go into SQ Light for me. So now what I need to do is I need to run that same command that we had earlier, which I think it was like Pragma or something like that. Uh, what is it called? Yeah, Pragma. Pragma, uh, actually, um, first we're gonna do dot tables. So that's what we're gonna do first. We're gonna do dot tables to see what is in what is inside of this thing. And so we have sessions and we have users. Those are the two tables that we got in here. Let me just bring this to the center of the screen a little bit. So since we have sessions and we have users, what we really want based on the questions that they're asking us here is the information of the admin user. So, so far this is what we got, right? So it says, what's the name of the mentioned directory? That's secret, it's assets. Uh, what is the file that's on there that's sensitive? It's a web app database. And then now we need to find this hash value. And of course, you know that that's exactly what I'm about to do is I'm about to run this pragma code right here or this pragma command. So I have the, the name of the table that I got with dot tables. I'm going to use pragma table information and then get the, uh, the user's information of that. And then from there, we are going to get the info that we need, buddy. So, all right, and so these are the columns that we have over here. 
uh, inside of our table users. So we're going to run our select everything from users. And there we go. I forgot to put this semicolon at the end of it. Uh, so it gave me a new line to finish it. Um, but here it is, right? So we have the, the, the column itself is going to have a user ID next to it. There's going to be some text and then that's basically it. So you have the, the information right here. You have the user ID and then you got some text. And it seems to be that this is the, uh, the, the hash value for the admin user. So let's go and double check that here. And that is indeed the case. That is the hash value of the admin user. So you know what we're gonna do now. So we're gonna go ahead and copy this hash value. And then from there, we're gonna go to crack station and crack the darn thing. And it seems like it's an easy one. <laughs> it's an easy one to crash. Uh, so because of the fact that this is kind of taking uh, forever for me to click on it, I'm just gonna go and copy it from our answers. And then we're gonna to go to crack station. We're gonna paste it. And we're going to crack this hash. And look at that. That is the password of the admin. And if you actually look at your keyboard, these are all of the letters that are in the top that are in the top row of the keyboard. So it's it starts with Q and then it just goes Q W E R T Y QWERTY and then U I O P and that's their password, right? So it's not a it's not any word or anything that you would recognize looking at it, but when you see the pattern on the keyboard, you're like, "Oh, that's that's a pretty lazy and easy password." And just like that, that's the thing. And then so when we crack it, we got QWERTY. And so now we're going to log in as the admin and we're actually going to get access to that information. So easy money. And here we go. There is the flag just like that. And here's the flag right here. So pretty easy, right? It's not, it's, it's kind of simple uh, and scary how simple it is to do some of these things. And all it takes is for somebody to know a website like CrackStation, for them to know that they can right click on the web page and go view page source and then get all of the page source uh, data that's on the screen or do right click on the page and click on inspect and then they get to see all of the data that's on the screen. And if your developer was lazy or they forgot to delete a com comment or something that they left for themselves, that's all it takes is for somebody to get the information that they should not have access to. And I mean, there's a lot of other tools that you can also use to look at the directories that belong to a website. So we could have used Nikto, for example, to just scan this website and get the information on the different directories and then go to that directory and then find this database file. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do this, but this one was a very, very weak website, obviously. And from there, we were able to just do use our browser to go ahead and find some sensitive information. So it's really, really crazy how easy it is to do these things. And, uh, you know, just bear in mind as you're doing this for a website or for your company, or if you're trying to hack somebody, not, not, not saying that you should, but if you are, you know, it's sometimes it's that easy. So, uh, let's look at the injection vulnerability here. All right, injection comes in two big forms right here. You have SQL injection, as in, as you already saw, we know what SQL uh, tables look like. And so SQL injection implies to the fact that you can go to a website that has a search bar or some kind of an input field. Uh, and it could even be like the username login uh, field or something like that, but basically a search bar uh, typically works and you go inside that search bar and you inject uh, an SQL command. So you say select such and such from such and such, and that's a basic SQL command, or you do, you do a dot tables command or something just to see what, it go, uh, what actually exists and what kind of table that they're using, anything like that. So uh, that will, if it's a weak website and it hasn't properly been uh, secured, it'll return information to you that you shouldn't have access to. For example, the information inside of their SQL tables. Another one is command injection. So you you just type in some kind of commands. It could be a um, what is it? It could be a JavaScript command, which is a really big deal and it's used very frequently. It could be Python. It could be a bunch of different types of command that you should not be able to inject into the website. And then when you do that, uh, it'll return some kind of result. So it's considered a system command. 
And when you do that, it'll execute some kind of command on the servers and then allowing you to get access to their systems or do some things that you shouldn't be able to do on their system. So one of the easiest ways or some of the easiest ways to uh, defend against this is number one, use an allow list, which means that there's a certain number of inputs that are allowed to be placed into your server and into your search box and all of those uh, data points where you can actually enter information. And anything that's outside of that allow list is automatically just declined and it's rejected. Another one is stripping the input, meaning that if somebody puts a asterisk inside when they shouldn't, or if they put uh, any kind of symbol inside where they shouldn't, uh, it automatically strips that input and it doesn't allow it to go through, which means that the full command itself won't be processed. So if you're running a JavaScript uh, specifically, if you're running any kind of code and you're trying to input that in there, it'll strip that code uh, of all of these malicious input uh, characters and those characters aren't going to be processed. Therefore, the command doesn't run and your website is protected. So you can either have an allow list, which can be kind of lengthy, or you can just do a simple stripping of the input so that they can't input any kind of dangerous characters and it won't mess with your website or return any information that it shouldn't or it won't process any commands that it shouldn't. So that is what injection is. So we can now look at command injection and some examples that goes into it. All right, so we already talked about command injection a little bit and what it actually does. So PHP could be one of the languages that runs on a web application. There's a lot of web applications that operate based on the PHP language. And so if somebody can get access to some kind of an input area that they shouldn't get access to and run some PHP commands, then they get some information that they shouldn't get access to. So uh, an injection web vulnerability allows us to be able to make those calls and get those commands executed and get some information out of it. Uh, an example for this is the cowsay command. And uh, uh, it's called the cowsay uh, online. I think they actually made this specifically to demonstrate this. Um, but there was at one point that people were using it um, for to run their websites. And uh, it kind of turned into a big deal. I, I'm, I'm not sure on that, you know, so fact check me on that and correct me on that. But MooCorp has started developing a web application um, and while searching for ways to implement their app, they come across CalSay command in Linux, which does exactly that. Instead of coding a whole web, web application, uh, they decide to write some simple code that allows the CalSay command from operating the system console and sends it back, uh, sends the contents back to the website. So if you look at the code, it's like this. So it says if uh, this thing, the algorithm, uh, not the algorithm, excuse me, the variable, uh, get is set to mooing and then mooing equals get mooing count etc so i'm not going to break this down because they actually explain it over here so it says if the parameter mooing is set then the uh if the variable mooing gets what's passed into the input field so if the parameter mooing is set so if this is set then whatever is passed into it uh, uh, the variable mooing gets whatever is passed inside of that parameter. Now, if the parameter cal is set, so if set is, uh, if is set cal, so if the parameter cal is set, then the variable cal gets what's passed through the parameter. So then it actually executes the full command. So this is it. So it, it basically checks two set parameters. So if this is set and if this is set in that case, we're going to pass through both of those things, both of those variables, cal and mooing, and then we're going to execute it, meaning it's going to be a Perl command that says that uses cal say binary and it executes those things. So when you do that, then you get some really interesting results. So in this case, this is our actual search bar and you have your, it says your default cal. So your version of the cal variable is default and the parameter right here the input right here goes into the variable mooing so when you actually press submit here it runs this first portion of the command right so it runs this right here and then now whatever is input here is going to be passed through to the cal variable and whatever is here is going to be passed through to the mooing variable so it said try hack moo and try hack moo is passed and so right here the cal comes out and says try hack moo right? So very, very simple, nothing complicated about it. I mean, unless you don't know anything about code and shit like that, but 
All you really need to understand is that this thing is connected to the cal variable and this one is connected to the moving variable. And then whatever is chosen here gets passed to that and whatever is chosen here or whatever is input here, typed here, gets passed to that. And then the result is this little cal is going to say whatever is input here. So now what we can do is we can actually put some kind of malicious code in here and this cow is going to, instead of typing out the code, it should give us some kind of a result. So for example, echo my username is who am I? My username is jdoe. And uh, this echo command is actually just prints whatever you put into here in a string. So it says it's executing who am I jdoe, parse the result back in the outer command, which is going to be executing echo. Um, this is it's kind of beyond the scope of this. You should have an understanding of PHP and how this whole thing uh, works. But apart from that, uh, this is really what it does is that uh, if you just type into a terminal, some kind of PHP command. So for example, echo, and then give it a string value. So everything inside of these quotes is a string. And then we gave it a variable, which is variable who am I? And who am I is a command that you run that gives you the name of the user of that you're logged into. So then when you run that right here, for example, you run who am I as the variable and it'll give you again, the default is going to be our cow variable and the who am I command is the moving variable and the cow instead of printing out who am I, it actually gives you the version or not the version, the username that you're logged into, which is in this case, a website server, which is Apache. And so it literally runs that for you and it gives that back to you. And so you can run a bunch of different types of commands in uh, PHP. So you have who am I, ID, IP configuration, and the IP address. So this will give you the IP address of the, the web server or the machine, uname A, which gives you the username, uh, uh, information of the version of the uh, Apache uh, server that we're on and processes if you wanted to list them. So these are some of the things that we're going to be running. So uh, it says what strange text file is in the website's root directory. So what we can do in that case is we can run ls which is a command to list things. So here we go. This is what we got over here. So I'm going to close this little piece of code at the bottom just to make this a little bit easier to process and we're gonna mess around with some commands here. So let's see what we can get. All right, very, very simple, look at that. So I just, all I ran was the dollar sign and I think it should show me the commands. There you go, that's the command that I ran. So very, very simple, you just have to put a dollar sign in front of it and put whatever your command is inside parentheses and ls is a command to list. And so it gave me the CSS, drpepper.txt, index.php and JS. Those were the stuff that's inside our root folder here and so it's asking what is the text file and so drpepper.txt now it says how many non-root or non-service non-daemon users are there and to be able to find that we would actually have to uh, find the command for it and i forgot how to do that so let me let me check google real quick okay so it's actually very basic i thought it was going to be a complicated thing but we're literally doing a cat which is concatenate or just print out onto the screen the contents of the etc password file and the ETC, etc password file has a list of all of the users that are assigned to this particular web server and when we run this we should actually get there we go so we get all the information on here and so you have root bin daemon so on and so forth and it gives you all of the the users in here and the, I mean there's a lot of them um, and let me see here what do we have that is non root or non daemon non uh, non whatever the other one that it was um, so all right so here is some information that will make this a little bit easier to understand so the UID 0 is reserved for root anything between 1 to 99 is reserved for other uh, predefined accounts, which are daemon accounts, and everything between 100 to 999 are reserved by the system for administrative and system account groups. So anything essentially less than a thousand uh, is something that we're looking for, or excuse me, anything over a thousand is what we're looking for that would be considered a non-root, non-service, or non-daemon account. And this is how it breaks down right here. So if you look at it, you see root and then x, 0, 0, root, da 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 So uh, this would be 1, which is the username. 
uh, two would, would be the password, which is going to be always an X because inside of the ETC password file, we're not going to get any kind of password information. Um, all that stuff is inside the ETC shadow file. And the third piece is the user ID. So it's the it's between the the second and the third colon is the information that we're looking for. So if we go back over here, we will see that. So you have the user, you have the X for their uh, password, and then you have everything between the second and the third colon. And there is nothing that is above the number thousand. So there's literally all of these right here, starting from Apache. And if you go all the way over here, uh, nobody 65,534. That is technically, I don't think that, that even counts. Um, you have 405, 209, 123, 89, 85, 35. Uh, the, what is it? You have uh, 31, 25, 22, 21. So it doesn't look like there's any in here. So if we go to our answer here, the answer that we had previously was zero. So that is the correct answer. And so what user is this app running as? So what we want to do is we want to run the who am I command to see what user we're running as. So let's go do that one. And when we run who am I, it gives us the user Apache, which is the answer to this question right here. And what is the user's shell set as? And so if we go here, right here where it says bin bash, that's what the very last item on that is, which is their command shell. So when we're looking at it, uh, we're trying to find the very last item. So we're going to go back in here and then we're going to run the who am I command one more time. And we're just going to not who am I, excuse me, the the ATC password command. And from here, we're going to look at the Apache user and then see what their shell is set as. And there we go. So we got Apache, their user information and then SBIN no login is their shell. And so it's been no login and what version of Alpine Linux is running. And I believe that is the uname a command. So let's go and run that one. All right. When I ran the uname command, it gave me this information, but uh, the information that we're looking for is actually not in this result. So we're going to run a different search command real quick. And it is uh, this one right here, which is LSB release uh, dash a. So we're going to run that. And that should give us the information that we're looking for. And it is not the case. All right, we're going to test out another one, which is uname r. Let's see what this one gives us. So I think actually the previous command that we ran was uh, the right one, the uname a, and it gave us all the information, but it was, uh, it's not uh, congruent with the very last uh, time that I ran this lab. Because when I ran this, I actually did it a while ago and I think that uh, information has changed maybe the server that's been applied to this has changed so I'm gonna run this one other piece right here and see if there's any other information that will come out of this um, oh no yeah there we go so 3.16.0 name Alpine Linux so on and so forth so 3.16.0 so it actually has not changed it was just a different command that we ran and I literally got that command from uh, just going to Google and finding a bunch of different terminal commands that would give us the version. So uname R was the one, the first one that I ran. And then you have cat etc release uh, the NERM that'll uh, release, uh, that'll give the name and version of the Alpine Linux that's running on our server. And so that is the one that actually worked for us. And it is 3.16.0. That would be the answer. So it's actually the the etc release uh, command that we have here which is right here so cat etc uh, cat forward slash etc forward slash asterisk dash release and then you put all of that inside of the parentheses and then you get your information like that so there we go and that is it for uh, this one for command injection so let's go look at some insecure design flaws all right, and secure design has to do with the actual setup of the application itself. These aren't actual uh, vulnerabilities or anything like that. It's what was done when they were planning to build the application and they took some uh, bad uh, steps in the thread modeling or preparing for the application's design and creation. So it's an actual flaw that was inside of the design of it. 
Um, and secure design vulnerabilities may also be introduced by developers by adding shortcuts around the code to make testing easier and then they never removed it. So if they disabled the one-time password validation in the development phase to quickly test the rest of the app and then not put it back, that's a design flaw and insecure design flaw. So uh, a version of this would be insecure password resets. So um, this happened on Instagram a while ago. Uh, they allowed users to reset their forgotten passwords by sending a six-digit code to their mobile device. And if the attacker wanted to access their account, they could just brute force the six-digit code. And this wasn't directly possible because Instagram had rate limiting, meaning after 250 attempts, they would just get blocked from doing anything further. Um, that's what rate limiting is. And if it's a six digit code, there's literally so many different versions, uh, definitely more than 250. I don't know what the number is, but it's definitely more than 250. But they found out that the rate limiting only applied uh, from the same IP. So if somebody had multiple IP addresses, then they could go up to 250 with one IP from 250 to 499 with another IP and then just keep going until they found the actual version of the six digit code that they needed to be able to uh, get the, the password of the person. So it's kind of a big flaw. Uh, it is more of a complex flaw compared to some of the other ones that we noticed, but it is still a pretty big flaw, especially for a website like Instagram. So uh, this is one of those things that was a design flaw on, uh, on Instagram's part. And no user would be capable of using thousands of IP addresses to make concurrent requests to try to brute force something. It's in the design rather than the implementation of the application itself. So what we're going to try to do in this case is we're going to go to the uh, another version of the website that we've been using and get into Joseph's account and then try to find the design flaw in the password reset mechanism and then try to figure out what we can do and abuse it and log in as Joseph. And so it's going to be on the port 85 on this website. All right, so you land on the website. Uh, it asks for your username and password. I just clicked on uh, forgot my password and uh, what do I need? I just need to use my username, which is Joseph in this case. And let's see what the instructions are for us to be able to reset our password as Joseph. What's your mother's sister's son, nephew's uh, neighbor's friend name? So there's a few different security questions that's available for Joseph. Uh, it could be that one. It could be your favorite color. It could be your first pet's current address. So probably the easiest one would be the favorite color. And we can just mess around with a few different colors to see what we can get. So let's do red. That was incorrect. So let's try to do blue as the other one. That is also incorrect. So let's do green as another one. Oh, that was it. So there you go. The password for Joseph has been reset to this. So that was his favorite color is green. So we are going to now copy this password and go to the login page and we're going to log in as Joseph. See how easy that is? <laughs> this is obviously an exa exaggeration because it's not going to be that simple, but uh, it's just to kind of prove the point and drive the point home. And so when we log in as Joseph, there's a note here, and if I go inside the note, uh, it says to move private files out of the server. Okay, fine, so it's not his note. Uh, private, let's go to private and see what we can get here. And there you go, inside his private directory, there's the flag. And there you go, and that's the flag right here. Not even cats could save you, that's it. All right, so now let's go into the next one, which is security misconfigurations. Security misconfigurations uh, happen when security has not been properly configured. Uh, it should have been, but it wasn't. So for example, it could be a default account that has an unchanged password. Usually a system comes with a default account and it has a default password. And if they never change those things, that's a security misconfiguration. If you have a permission on your cloud services like a Amazon S3 bucket, uh, that is very, very, uh, it's another security misconfiguration. Uh, unnecessary features, error messages that are overly detailed and allow attackers to find out more about the system. So if the error message gives a version of the uh, OS that was responded or it says that, you know, this command doesn't work or 
anything of the sort instead of just saying incorrect try again that could be information that can be exploited uh, not using http security headers and these are just a few of them so you can actually go to the OWASP top 10 uh, website and look at security misconfiguration and then under that you get to see a lot more results as far as the different things that could uh, that could be used as security misconfiguration so uh, something that happened previously to patreon in 2015 was that there's something uh, called the console so forward slash console and it can give you an interactive terminal on the web page that you can print commands into and you can uh, actually run those commands and i think it's called work work zook or work Zook, whatever however you pronounce this um, that gives you a console that can be accessed via a URL. And so it can literally be done in a lot of, uh, in a few different ways because uh, it could also be presented to the user if an exception is raised by the application. In both cases, it provides a Python console that can run any code that you send to it. So if you know how to use Python or if you know how to use the internet and Google, then you can try to find a bunch of different commands that you can run. So uh, for example, if we go to the console that's on our web page, we can run this command right here, which is importing the OS. And then you do a semicolon and then print onto the screen, which is os.popen and then this command and then read it. So that's the command itself that's being done with Python. So this is actually two commands that's being run. Number one, it's importing OS so that you can run OS commands. And then the second one is the command itself. So I'm just going to take this exact same command and I'm going to run it. And in this case, it's going to give us an LSL, meaning it's going to list whatever's inside of our, our terminal. So let's go into the next port on our uh, website here and run those commands. All right. So this is the website itself. Nothing exciting to do here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to forward slash console because that's the one that they gave us. Uh, and let's see what we can do. There you go. We have the interactive console here ready to go. And so I can just drop in import OS, print the command, and then we're going to run it. And there it is. These are the contents of our command here. So you have app.py, dockerfile requirements.txt templates, to do dot database. So we have a bunch of things that we can run here. So what is the question it's asking us? It says, what's the database file? So to do dot database, that's the question here. And so now it says modify the code to read the contents of app.py, uh, which contains the application source code. What is the value of the secret flag in the source code? So all we need to do is just read this command right here. So we're, we want to read the app.py command. So I'm literally going to do the same thing. I'm going to drop this in here. I'm going to repaste that original command. Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't copy it for whatever reason. Uh, so we're going to take this command and we're going to repaste this thing. And then it's going to be the um, cat app.py. That's the command that we actually want to run. And there we go. So these are the contents of the app.py file. So now what we're looking for is the variable that, uh, what is the variable called? The variable is secret flag. So we're looking for the secret flag variable on this page. So let's try to, oh, there it is. It's literally right at the top. So secret flag, THM, yada, 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 tiny misconfiguration. And so we copy this and that is our flag which is just a tiny misconfiguration. So easy, like super freaking easy. Um, but yeah, that's another one. So this is a security misconfiguration that allows for a console to be presented to somebody that has access to that link. And then if you just go to it and you know anything about Python, then you can, you can run your Python command and get information that you shouldn't have access to. So that is security misconfiguration. Uh, let's talk about vulnerable and outdated components, which is, I mean, this one's pretty self-explanatory. I feel like we don't even need to do this, but let's just, let's just read through it. Why not? So if your website is outdated, if your computer is outdated, any of those things, obviously, so in this case, we're talking about web applications. So it's, it would be the website. 
if they're using WordPress, for example, and if they haven't updated their version of WordPress in a while, uh, you can use something called WP Scan, which is a terminal uh, command line tool. And it's super freaking easy to use. And it can give you the version of WordPress. And then if you look online, you can see that for WordPress 4.6, for example, there's a vulnerability for remote code execution. And then you can go to exploit database, which is a large database of exploits that are already pre-written, ready for you to use at any point. And then you can just use that exploit that's been given for WordPress 4.6 and then get uh, into their website, right? And execute execute some uh, remote code. Um, this would be very, very bad uh, because it doesn't require any work, very, very little work on the attacker's part. And then they have access to the kingdom. So uh, this is uh, what is horrible about having outdated or uh, vulnerable uh, versions of websites or versions of portals or versions of the, uh, what are they called? The web builders, right? These are, WordPress is technically a web builder and it's a platform that you can use to build your website and it's really, really common and a lot of people use it, I use it, but if it's an outdated version, if it's an old version of WordPress, that means there's probably a vulnerability that exists and somebody could just go find that vulnerability really easily. And so you guessed it, right? We're about to go and actually find some exploits to be able to run uh, against this website that we got. So let's do that. This is an example uh, exploit that is for the Nostromo 1.9.6 uh, web server. And so on this website's uh, homepage, there's the actual version of the web server that they used. And so if you go to exploit database, and then just search for Nostromo 1.9.6, then you get a list of uh, <laughs> a list of exploits that come pretty. Uh, they're just built for you, um, and then you can just download any of them and use any of them. So in this particular case, it's a Python file, and if you run it, then it gives you certain things. So it says, uh, you know, in this particular case, when they ran it, uh, it gave back an error, and it said that the uh, variable right here is not defined. Now, if you know anything there is to know about Python, you can kind of just read through the Python code and see what the issue is. And it actually, it's nice because it gives you the line of the code that the error happened in. So it says in line 10, there's this thing and it's not defined. And in this case, there was a comment right here that says this line needs to be commented. And all you need to do is put a hashtag uh, in front of it and it will comment this out and it won't you know, the same error won't be caused anymore. And so when you do that, you run the code again. And in this particular case, you also have some uh, instructions, I think that told you that you need to potentially uh, use the, oh no, this is just the, the IP address and the port that you wanna do. And then you use the port and IP address that you wanna attack, and then you just use the ID command. So it's just a terminal command that's gonna run. So you do Python, uh, the file itself, the IP address and the port, and then you do ID and it'll run and it'll give you back the ID, which is in this case, this information. So now we have remote code execution happening. And then if that means if that ran that you could probably run any other code as well, and you'll probably be met with some kind of a successful output. So most scripts is going to tell you the arguments that you have to provide. Um, they rarely make you uh, read potentially hundreds of lines of code to figure out what you need to do. So that's one of the things that is really nice about a lot of these exploits that have been pre-made by these hackers and left on exploit database for us. So um, it's, 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 it's scary. Like the more I go through stuff like this, I'm like, damn, dude, I can't believe that it's that easy sometimes. Um, so anyways, this is it for this particular exploit example. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a lab on this. We're going to try to find some kind of a vulnerability exploit for this web page. All right, so this is it. That's going to be our URL that we're going to go to. There's a hint here. Uh, it's a bookstore application. You should check for recent unauthenticated bookstore app remote code execution. So that's what the hint gave us. And so this is the actual web application. It says, it says CSE bookstore and uh, my PHP, my SQL, procedure functions, so on and so forth admin login 2017 so let's click on the admin login at the bottom right here see what we can find here nothing to see here 
Uh, let's see what other information that we can find that might be able to make it easy for us to find an exploit for this. Okay, so there's nothing there. Um, I am going to just run with this and let's go search for CSE Bookstore to see what we can find on Exploit DB. Okay, so there we go. CSE Bookstore actually shows up and we have multiple SQL injection, persistent cross-site scripting, authentication, bypass. These are some of the things that we can do with this. So let's see uh, which one will end up working for us. I think I actually need to do this on the on the browser of this thing right here. So let's go here and do it. All right, this one actually, I had to do a few different types of searches. So uh, when you do bookstore as one word, you only get uh, four different exploits that show up. And then when you split it up between, uh, when you turn it into two words, basically, you get a much larger list of exploits that come out. And then there's one in particular that I believe is the one that I used last time, which is this one. Uh, it's the only one that has a check mark next to it. So online bookstore, unauthenticated remote code execution. And this is the one I believe. Yeah. So this is also the ID uh, 47887. So this is going to be the one that we're going to use. And uh, since I'm already inside this attack box, I'm just going to download it. And then from here, we're going to uh, modify some of the code. And what we're going to do is we're just going to read through the instructions here. And I think it should be fine. I don't think there needs to be anything that I need to really uh, modify here, um, but it gives us the, the comments at the very top. So exploit is this, Google doc, da 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 vendor homepage, software link, tested, CVE, NA. And that's basically it. There's really nothing else that's been listed here as far as instructions. I'm gonna look at the rest of the code to see if there's anything that we need to modify. But I think this is pretty much it. So let's check it out. All right, there were no other comments to check out. So we're just gonna download this thing and then we're going to run it in our terminal on the attack box and see what we can get out of here. All right, there is my file, 47887 right here. This is our Python file. And uh, we do need to provide an argument, which is basically uh, what we want to apply this code to. So I think it's maybe Python 3 that I gotta use. We'll see which one it is. Uh, 47887.py and then we want the website that we're trying to hack, which is, uh, let's see, what was it? 1010.2.1084 uh, and let me extend this thing so it doesn't die on me. 1010.2.1084 and then 84. Okay, cool, that worked. And so it says, do you wanna launch a shell here? And I do wanna launch shell, there we go, RCE. So if I do LS, hopefully it'll work. It'll like, give me something. There you go, look at that. So we have all the information uh, and it actually listed everything that we're in. So if I do print working directory, for example, it should tell me where I am and it is definitely working. So now, what is the question? Uh, the question, where is it? Lab, right here. So it says, what is the contents of the opt flag file? So I just really need to do that. So I'm just gonna do cat opt flag.txt, and there we go. And there it is, THM, but it's not my fault, but it kinda is though. And there we go, that is it. So. Let's move on to identification and authentication failures. All right, this is actually a big one, and I think it's very, very important uh, to understand how this whole thing works. So typically when you log into a website, you provide your username and password, and then when you log in, you can choose uh, save identity, right? So when you uh, basically save your credentials into your browser, and that way your browser knows that it's you, and then the next time that you go to that website, it keeps you logged in so you don't have to re-log in every single time and what's generated every time when you do that is called a session cookie so your cookies go into your cache and it gets saved and then that way you can essentially just revisit that website as many times as you want without having to log back in and that's you know my interaction with try hack me right now is just like that right every time i go to try hack me i don't have to log back in because it's already remembered me and there is a session cookie that's been attached to my browser on this particular computer so when that happens, 
uh, you can kind of take advantage of that vulnerability. So if an attacker is able to find flaws in the mechanism, they might successfully gain access to the other user accounts. This allows them to access sensitive data and some flaws in authentication include brute force attacks. So if a web application uses username and passwords, they can, we can, as an attacker, we can try to launch brute force, meaning just try to bunch of different uh, passwords using a dictionary to try to guess the username and password that's uh, associated with it. Uh, weak credentials, as we already visited CrackStation, I mean, it's pretty easy to uh, crack somebody's uh, password, especially if they're using a weak password and you just get their hash value and go to a website like CrackStation and it gives you the password. So, for example, if you use password one or some kind of an easy ass password like that, then that's it. And then there's another one, which is the weak session cookie. So session cookies is how the server keeps track of users. And if a session cookie contains predictable values, then we can use our own. We can set our own session cookies and user and access the user's account. So there's a lot of very uh, mitigation efforts for broken authentication. And depending on what that is, you can kind of solve for it. Some of the most basic ones are to avoid password guessing attacks to make sure that you actually have a really strong password policy, avoid brute force attacks um, by doing automatic lockout as a policy so that if somebody has three failed password attempts, then it locks them out and then the attacker can no longer do a brute force attack. Uh, implementing multi-factor authentication. So if they have their username and password, it asks, okay, we're gonna send you a secret code to your email or we're gonna send you a secret code to your phone number or maybe use uh, Google Authenticator or uh, some kind of a third-party authentication like that to just make sure that these people are actually who they say they are when they try to log into the system. So authentication and ad identification are really important. They're number seven on the list, but it's still super important to be able to mitigate for this and prepare for this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run another exercise and uh, we're going to now try to uh, log in as admin and then Darren to try to get some information uh, from this website. All right, in this practical, we're gonna be going to this web server and there's a very interesting concept here so that you know, obviously there's most likely gonna be a user named admin. Um, but if it's not configured properly, if the website authentication is not configured properly, if you use admin with a space in the beginning, um, it'll still uh, register you. But now because you're registering as a new user, you can assign your own password and then it'll actually register you as an administrator and give you all the uh, access rights of that user, that original admin user. So to actually see this in action, we're gonna do this for the user, Darren. So we're gonna to go to this website, here we go, learn about attacking authentication, yada, yada, yada. So we're gonna to try to log in as Darren, and then it's gonna allow, it's gonna say no, right? Cause you can't do it, cause uh, whatever. I'm gonna type in password as his password to see if that's his actual password. Watch it be his password. Okay, so invalid username and password, there you go. So that's not good. So I'm gonna register now as a new user, but I'm gonna do space Darren instead of doing uh, any other thing. So I'm gonna do space, then Darren, and then I'm gonna use Darren at THM.com as the email, and then we're gonna do password as our password. And we're gonna register, and there we go, we have been registered successfully. So now we're gonna do Darren and do password. And that's gonna be invalid. So what we're gonna do again is we're gonna do space Darren. It sounds like an uh, astronaut name. Space Darren and then password and log in. And look at that, we are logged in. And there is the content that we need for our flag right here. So where's the flag that you found? And that's the flag. And so let's try to do it with Arthur and same process. So now that we know that it's not gonna let us do it, so we're just gonna go and log out. And I'm just gonna register as a new user instead of going back and forth and showing you all that. So I'm gonna register here. And then it's gonna be space Arthur and then Arthur at THM.com, and then password as his password. And there we go. We have been successfully registered. 
So we're now going to use space Arthur and password. And there it is. So fairly simple to understand. And this was just a weak authentication mechanism for that website. So it's kind of crazy. It's it it seems overly simplistic, but it's very very crazy how that works. So, uh, software and data integrity failures. So let's check this out. When we refer to integrity in cybersecurity and data information security, uh, we're making sure that the whatever the software is or the data is, it's been unmodified. So it hasn't been altered or changed in any way. And the way that we do that is we check the hash value of it. So if you wanted to go to, uh, let's go to Kali. So if we go to Kali.org uh, for Kali Linux, and then you want to download any of these uh, Kali Linux versions. So if you go and click on any of these, so I'm going to click on ARM. And then I go here and I check one of these things. And oop, I didn't mean to download it. So let's stop that. And let's go here. Uh, what I want to do is right here. So I'm going to click on sum. When I click on sum, it gives me this SHA-256 sum. This is the hash value of the file that I'm downloading. And if you download this from any other place and you, you know, they say, yeah, this is a Kali ARM uh, version that you want to download and you run the SHA-256 sum to get the hash value of the file that you downloaded. If it's anything other than this hash value, you can be sure that that file has been altered in some way. And this is how you verify the integrity of something that you're downloading. They use this a lot, this concept of the uh, file integrity. This is used a lot in forensics. In digital forensics, there's something called the chain of custody. And in the chain of custody, you start out with getting the copy of the evidence from the crime scene. And immediately the forensic investigator, the digital forensic investigator creates a hash value of that disk image that they got. And they put that hash value in the, uh, the forms that go along with chain of custody. And along that, uh, the management of that piece of evidence, if that hash value has changed even by one letter. And I mean, if anything changes, the entire hash value changes as you saw when we went through the password example at the beginning. So if that hash value has changed from the beginning hash value, that means that file has been altered, that is disk image has been altered. So that's what we use to verify the integrity of data. And so software and data integrity failures typically refers to this specific example that something has been changed inside of the source code of that software or something has been changed by the, the, the macros of the file that you're downloading or anything along those lines. If it's been altered in any way, then you know that the hash value has been changed and uh, now you have a different file that you're dealing with. So uh, the example of WinSCP uh, is what we can check. And so this was uh, this is on the SourceForge repository. And you look at it like this. And this is just another version of what we just checked out on Kali Linux that it gives you the hash values right here. So there's the MD5 hash values, SHA-1 and SHA-256 hash values of this. And then from there, you get to run uh, the MD5 sum, SHA-1 sum, SHA-256 sum against the file that you've downloaded. And it should be the exact same thing that's available on their website. If it's not, that means that you downloaded an altered file and there's something wrong with that file and you should not open that file. You shouldn't run it. You shouldn't do anything with it. And this is very important to understand that anything that you download, if you're not downloading it directly from the website. So if you're not downloading from the Microsoft app store, for example, and you're downloading from something separately, you can verify the hash value of the file that you downloaded to make sure that you actually have the right file. Otherwise it's been altered and you should not use it. So, Software and data integrity failures, uh, they arise from code or infrastructure that uses software data without using any kind of integrity check. And since there is no integrity verification being done, an attacker might modify the software and data passed to the application, resulting in unexpected consequences. And two vulnerabilities are software integrity failures and data integrity failures that are relevant to this. So 
we are now going to look at that in a real life example. So software integrity failures. Suppose you have a website that uses third party libraries that are stored in some external server and they're out of your control. Um, this is actually a common practice. And so we can example use jQuery, uh, which is a JavaScript library. Uh, if you want to use jQuery in your website, uh, you're using without actually downloading it, you use the following command and you use their link for the script, right? So you use the, the link from their actual jQuery website to be able to use this, right? Without actually having to download it. Uh, when a user navigates to the website, it'll, the browser is going to read the HTML code and download jQuery and then process everything that you want uh, in your code as if you had downloaded jQuery directly to your website. Now, the problem is this, if an attacker somehow hacks jQuery and they change the contents of this endpoint, and inject any kind of malicious code, then that puts you at risk as well. So anyone visiting your website could now pull the malicious code, execute it, and without them knowing something's going on on their website. This is an integrity failure on software. And the correct way to insert the uh, library in HTML code would be to use the SRI and include, uh, which is the sub resource integrity. And you can include the integrity's hash value uh, so that somehow uh, the attacker is able to modify the library and if any navigating through your website won't exclude the modification itself. Um, now, this is what it should look like here. So you have the original script portion, but now you're verifying the integrity using the SHA-256 sum that has been attached to that. And now you can go and generate hashes for your library if you need it, or excuse me, you can run this on your website if you need it. But if you wanted to generate any kind of hash value, you can do that as well if you need it. So uh, what we're trying to do in this particular case is get the hash value of this thing, HTTP, uh, HTTPS code, such and such and such. So we can just go copy this and go here and then run that URL here. And we want the SHA-256, so we generate that hash, and here it is. This is the SHA-256 hash value of this. So if I copy this and come here, this is exactly it. So they actually have the SHA-256 portion at the beginning as well. So SHA-256 dash, and then the rest of that. And that is the full hash value that we got here. So that's software integrity. So let's look at data integrity in this case. All right, usually when a user logs into an application, they're going to be assigned some kind of session token. We kind of talked about this already. And it's saved on the browser for as long as the session lasts, especially if you save your username and password. Uh, then it's going to be repeated every single time that you access that uh, application. And then they come in a lot of different forms, specifically as cookies. Uh, they're through cookies. Um, and cookies are key value pairs. So the user, Susan, the user is the key and the value is Susan in this example and then there would be password equals yada 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 and so if you were creating a webmail application you can assign a cookie to each user after logging in and a subsequent request the browser would always send the username and the cookie so that, that web application knows what's going on and this would be a terrible idea security wise because cookies are stored on the browser and if the user tampers with the cookie and changes the username or if a hacker tampers with the cookie and changes with the username they could potentially impersonate someone else and read those emails. The application would suffer from a data integrity failure. And if somebody wanted to uh, hack into anybody's system, they could just sniff your traffic. And this is why they say, don't check your bank account or don't check your email when you're connected to a public Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, something like that. And a lot of people do this, by the way, because if you do do that, if you use the public Wi-Fi at a location like that, somebody could be sitting in that uh, cafe and they're scanning the, they're sniffing the traffic using Wireshark or TCP dump, and then they can capture that value from your cookies and then use that information to impersonate you and go into your information. I've, I've talked about this with a lot of my friends. One of my friends actually recently, or, you know, a couple of months ago, maybe uh, he got hacked and they got into his bank account and took money. It was crazy. There was like a really, really crazy situation. And he called me immediately. He's like, yo, what do I do? And I was like, you need to immediately change your password because I knew that he uses a bad password and he uses it on all of his stuff, on his, on his email accounts, on his computer login. 
And I just knew, I'm like, bro, you can't be using this. And I told him multiple times prior to that. And he still didn't listen to me until he finally got hacked. And then that was the case where it's like, okay, well, you got to use strong passwords, man. This is like a, it's not, it's not even a question at this point. If you use a weak password, you're just asking for it. So uh, a solution to this is an integrity mechanism to guarantee that the cookie hasn't been altered. And we could use some token implementations and uh, cryptography to provide proof of integrity uh, without you having to bother with it. And something like that is called JSON web tokens. Uh, JWTs are simply tokens that uh, allow you to store key value pairs uh, and uh, provide integrity as a part of that. And the idea is that you generate tokens that you give users with certainty that they won't be able to alter the value pairs uh, and pass that integrity check. And it comes in three parts. So you have the header, you have the payload itself, and then the signature. And the header is the JWT. So the type is J, uh, J, um, JWT, which is the JSON, JSON web token. Um, algorithm is going to be HS256 in this case. The payload itself is the username and the password. Uh, and uh, excuse me, I think the EXP is the expiration maybe for this. Um, and then you have a signature that's been attached to this and it comes in three pairs. And so that's how you verify the integrity of it. Uh, the header contains metadata indicating it's a JWP and HS256 is the algorithm. The payload contains the uh, data and then the signature is the is similar to a hash value to verify the integrity of that payload. And uh, we can use this online tool that they gave us um, to go ahead and encode or decode base64 and try encoding the header of the following token. So we're going to encode the header of this token, which is this piece. And so I go here and do this. And the encoding would be this. So if I decoded this, it gives me that. So it's JWP, JWT algorithm HS256. So um, yeah, it's a decode, not encode. Um, the signature contains binary data. So even if you decode it, you won't be able to make much sense of it. If we use the payload to decode, then you'll get username guest expiration, same thing. Um, so there it is. So this is decoding the, that's <laughs> so crazy, decoding the base 64 uh, information. So JWP, JWT and the non algorithm. So you just have a header and then you have a payload and there is no signature that's been attached to it. And uh, it's very similar to the other piece. Uh, it's just that there is no actual signature attached to this. So um, if we wanted to change the payload so that the username becomes admin and no signature check is done, we would have to decode the header and the payload, modify them and then encode them back. And then you remove the signature part, but kept the dot at the end, this little piece at the very end of it. Uh, so it sounds simple. So let's go and actually do this on our web uh, application here. So we're going to go to our portal right here and we're going to use the 8089 port and get some cool information here. All right, so here's our web portal here. So we're going to try to get logged in as guest. And so it says uh, invalid credentials. You can also log in as guest with the password guest. So it already gave us the password for a guest. So application as guest, what's the account password? Yada, yada, yada. So guest, guest. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to log in as guest, guest, and save that. And so we're going to save ourselves. Hello, guest. Only the admin user is allowed to get the flag. So now what we want to do is we want to follow the rest of these instructions. So it says if you're logged in, you should now have a JWT stored as the cookie in your browser. So we can look at the developer tools and uh, we can also do that by clicking right click inspect. And then we'll be able to look at it either if we're on Firefox, it's under storage. If you're on Chrome, it's under application. So in this case, I am on Firefox. So I'm going to click on inspect and then it'll give this information for me here. And then right here at the bottom, I'm gonna click on storage and then it has it saved right here. So the name for me is JWT session and this is the value that's been assigned to it. And notice how there's a dot here and then there's another dot here. Right. So what we got here is the first question. It says, what's the name of the website's cookie containing a Coke token? It's JWT session. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify the token. So the application thinks that we are the user admin 
and then presented, uh, get the flag that's been presented to us. So uh, in this case, what I need to do is I need to get this information. So if I click on this, I should be able to go in there. There we go. So I have this whole thing and I'm going to try to get the full thing. There you go. And I'm going to copy this and we're going to go on that one website that they gave us here, which is, where is it? This tool right here. So I can paste this. There we go. So this is the full thing that I copied. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the first portion and I'm going to remove the last portion. And now we have username guest and that's it. So now I want to do is I want to change this username to admin, uh, the output string. So I'm going to copy this part and I'm going to go to encode and I'm going to paste it. And now I'm going to change it to username admin. So this is what's the base 64 version of that is going to look like. So we're going to copy this and I'm just going to use like an online text editor to make this happen. So online text editor and we'll do edit pad here. And there we go. So this is the new thing that we got. So what I need is now this thing one more time. Copy, go here paste that. So now what we want to do is we want to replace this portion with the new info that we got. So we're going to copy this and we're going to paste it instead of this portion right here. So this it's basically between the two dots and now we have this. So now I'm going to go copy this whole thing and go inside of my browser and we're going to do control all to highlight that whole thing. And we're going to paste it in here and press enter. All right, so here's what we're going to actually modify here. We're gonna remove the signature because the error that I got is that either the token or the signature is invalid. And I know that I modified this part correctly, but the one part that I'm gonna change now is change the algorithm from HS256, which is what was over here. I'm gonna change it to none, and then we're gonna just remove the signature at the very end of it. So we're going to go back to our encoder decoder thing right here. And uh, so this is what I had. So I'm going to take this piece. I'm just going to take that out all together. I'm going to keep this piece of information like this. I think I might be able to even uh, do these in one line like so. Oh, there you go. Just like that. So I can change it in one line as such. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this whole thing and copy this, go here, put that in here. It should, uh, it did not separate it by dot. So what if I put a dot here? No. So it's not going to work like that. Uh, so we're going to separate them by two lines. Nope. It's not going to work. either. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to just remove this piece cause I already have this piece. And I'm going to change this to none. And this will be the new information. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to go to my notepad here and I'm going to paste it here. And now I have new information. So uh, we're going to keep that dot at the very, very end. I'm going to go back down here and we're going to change the value of this to our new value. Press enter. And here we go, fingers crossed. Refresh the page. There you go, just like that, it worked. THM, don't take the cookies from strangers. So uh, essentially what we did is we went uh, logged in as guest, we got the token. That's so crazy how, like, it's so scary how easy this shit is. Uh, we got the, the token uh, value here and it, it came in three sections, which it looked like uh, this. It had three different sections separated by these dots, right? And so we removed the very last piece, which is the signature, and then we changed the header from the algorithm HS256 to none, and then we changed the username to admin, and that's it, that's all we did. And then we pasted the new value after we encoded it with base64, and we were able to get our cookie. 
So that is that for data integrity failure. So uh, let's go to security logging and monitoring failures. All right. So when applications are set up, uh, everything needs to be logged. If not, I mean, it has to be logged. And usually it is logged. Um, we actually did a video. The last video that came out was on logging and auditing and all that. So um, logging keeps track of everything that has happened so that when you do an audit or when you're trying to do an incident response or trying to figure out what happened in any kind of situation, you just go review the logs to see what's going on. And usually there's a status code that's attached to it. There's timestamps, usernames, API endpoints and page locations, IP addresses. All of those things are inside of the log, each of the log items, like each line item inside of a log, usually, especially for web pages, has this information. So what type of HTTP requests they were making, the timestamps associated, usernames, endpoints and the IP addresses, the source IP and the destination IP addresses. So all of that information is usually inside of the log. And it's important to ensure that they are all stored and secured uh, and multiple copies are stored in different locations just in case somebody gets access to it or they wipe your systems. So um, after a breach or incident has occurred, you refer back to these things for incident response. Um, if there are multiple unauthorized attempts for a particular action, um, then it's logged in. Um, failed login or any kind of failed uh, uh, word that shows up inside of your logs, that's kind of a clue as to see what's going on. Request for anomalous IP addresses or uh, locations. There's an entire directory and list of anomalous IP addresses and a lot of different, MITRE has them. Um, uh, there's another one that was really, really big. I forget the name of it right now, but there's a lot of websites that collect anomalous IP addresses. Uh, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, has anomalous IP addresses. And it could be something that has been uh, done to attack your system. So it can indicate that someone else is trying to access a particular account. It can also have a false positive rate because somebody could be using somebody else's IP address to do this. Uh, automated tools, particular automated tooling can be identifiable. So using a user agent header or speed of request, these can mean that there's an automated tool that's being used it can indicate an attack is being uh, obviously so common payloads uh, in web applications is common for attackers to use payloads and detecting the use of these payloads can indicate whether or not somebody's trying to do something shady. Uh, detecting suspicious activity is not helpful just by itself. So you got to have something to either uh, rate the impact level or have some kind of remediation. So certain actions will have a higher impact than others and they need to be responded to sooner. So if it's more severe, you have to take care of that before you take care of the less severe ones. Very, very basic. So uh, what we're gonna do is analyze the provided sample log file, and it should be inside of this thing, download task files. Uh, hopefully it's already inside of the attack box that I'm in. Otherwise, I gotta find a way to transfer it. So uh, let's see if I can find that. All right, so I downloaded the log file on my own computer. And it's a small one, thankfully. <laughs> so what we can see is the status code, uh, the uh, specific flag that's been attached to it, the IP address, and the username that's been attached to it, and the timestamp, and then the page that they try to visit. So you have the login page in all the cases. You have the username in all the cases. Uh, 200 status code means that they were successful and it was all okay. And then this is the IP address that they used, right? So in this case, you have 401, 401, 401, which means it was an error, it was not accepted, and it was an unauthorized uh, request by this specific IP address trying to do admin, administrator, anonymous, or root. And it all happened very, very quickly, right? So it all happened at this specific time, five seconds apart. So you can tell that they're doing some kind of a brute force attack using admin administrator anonymous and root uh, login um, IDs here. So that's the, the log file that we're looking at. So now in this case, if we go here, it says what's the IP address of the attack that the attacker is using. And that's the IP address that we already established right here. And what's the type of attack? It's a brute force attack. So that one is pretty simple. And last but not least, we have server side request forgery. And this is a little bit of a complicated one. It took me a while to, 
kind of grab this or to wrap my head around it. So hopefully this time around, it'll be a little bit easier. And for this one, I'm actually going to read through all of this instead of trying to paraphrase it. So uh, this type of vulnerability occurs when an attacker can coerce a web application into sending requests on their behalf to arbitrary destinations while having control of the contents of the request itself. Uh, these vulnerabilities often arise from implementations where our web application needs to use third party services. So for example, if a web application uses an external API to send SMS notifications, which is text, to its clients, for each email, the website needs to make a web request to the provider's uh, server and then to send the content of the message to be sent. Since the SMS provider charges per message, they require you to add a secret key, which they pre-assign to you to each request that you make to their API. Uh, the API key serves as an authentication token and allows, you, uh, allows the provider uh, to know to whom the bill, uh, the bill should be sent. So basically, who do they need to charge? And the application looks like this. So you have the, uh, the URL. Inside of the URL, there's SMS followed by the question mark and then the server, which is the name of the server, .sms.thm, and the message is hello. And so it's gonna send the message hello, and it first sends the request, so get the, uh, the message, the full block right after the forward slash right here. It sends a get request, including that whole thing, it gets sent to the mysite.com, which is the uh, the actual domain itself, and the query is built, and this is what the query would look like. So it's going to be on the server SMS THM, API send, and then that's the message, and then forward it to the SMS provider using their API key. So this is what that would look like. It's another GET request, and then API send, that's the message, and this is their API key. And so following all of this, uh, we can understand where the vulnerability itself lies and it exposes the server parameter to the users, which defines the server name of the SMS service provider. And if the attacker wanted, they could simply change the value of the server to points to a machine that they control. And the web application would happily forward that request to the attacker instead of the SMS provider. As a part of the forwarded message, the attacker would obtain the API key allowing them to use the SMS service to send messages at our expense. And uh, they would need to make the following request to the website. So first they go to the website server is going to be the attackers server dot THM. And then the message is whatever. And then it would make the uh, request to attacker dot THM API send the message. And then you can just capture the contents using netcat and whatever that this would be their specific uh, server. So attacker.thm could be their IP address or anything of the sort. And if they have a netcat listener going on on their uh, port, on their port 80, which is the HTTP port, it would just receive that information because that's where they're sending it to. And then this is the information that they get, right? So uh, the connection received, get request, public docs, the host is this, the user agent, is all this information about the user agent and it's very this particular example is very basic but it's essentially the concept is how this works so uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to run this and hopefully this time around a little bit it'll be a little bit easier for me to actually complete this so um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to this web portal uh, we're going to find a sim simple web application we'll see an admin area and they, uh, that's going to be our main objective. So follow the instructions to try to gain access to the restricted area. So I'm going to go to uh, 8087 on our IP address. And here's the website. And so we're going to find the admin area in the menu. Admin interface only available from local host. Okay. So uh, explore the website. What is the... Uh, only host allowed to access this, which is local host. Uh, check the download resume button. Where does the server point to? So let's go back to our previous portion and let's go to, it's in the homepage where we can do download resume. So if we click on download resume, it's gonna point to file root download PDF. So this is actually pointing to the local host as it says. So um, where does the server parameter point to? Securefilestorage.com. Is that indeed the case? 
oh, you know what? Instead of clicking actual download, I think I'm going to do this. And let's see. We're going to do an inspect on that button and see where it goes. So there it is. And that's the button right here. So that's actually it right down here. So it points to download server secure file storage dot com, etc. So that's where it's pointing to. And so that's the answer right here. So now using server side request forgery, make the application send the request to your attack box instead of the secure file storage. Are there any API keys in the intercepted request? So what we got to do here is we got to point this to our server. So I'm going to copy this value and I'm going to change it to my server. And there it is. But I do need to put this portion at the beginning of it. So we, we do need to put the actual web page at the beginning of this whole thing. And we're going to put it at the very beginning right here. That's going to be the full link. And what we need to do is change the server. So from this, it's going to actually point to my uh, attack box. And so what I need to do first is I need to create a netcat listener the way that we had it uh, in the example that we got. So we're just going to do netcat LVP and I'll do port what 80. Uh, we'll just do port 80. So netcat LVP port 80 that's already in use. So <laughs> I'll do netcat LVP port 8087. Is that already in use? No, that's fine. So 8087, so that's already listening. And so now I got to do, I got to come up here and do 10, 10, 176, 126 as the actual dot com right here. So uh, HTTP 10, 10, 176, what was it? 176, 126, Let's see if that works. It worked. Look at that. Hey, it actually worked. Okay, that was not that bad. And there's our API key. I'm just an API key. And there it is. So this was not that bad. I don't know, maybe it was just so far over my head last time that I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but it seems to be way easier, <laughs> way easier this time around, right? So uh, that is it. So you just make sure that you have that portion correctly configured uh, or, you know, you just basically copy this entire value right here. You put it in front of the actual uh, URL right here and then you change the part where it's after the equal sign. You change equals to this entire piece right here, securefilestorage.com. You take that whole thing and you turn it into your attack box IP address, which is this particular case, or your computer's IP address at whatever port your netcat listener is running on, which is in this case, port 8087. And just like that, we got our flag and everything else was good. So very, very excited about this one. Uh, I'm very happy that that was actually done. <laughs> um, so this was actually uh, the beginner, uh, kind of like an introductory to OWASP top 10. We actually have two more rooms around OWASP top 10 um, API security, uh, top 10 one and top 10 two. So uh, we're going to do an entire other set of videos just around this concept. And it should be fun. Honestly, I'm very, very excited about it.